Good morning. Before I start my talk about climate change, I want to tell you the story about how I ended up standing here. The reason for me doing this talk can be traced back to November last year when I was visiting a very good friend who had moved to Sheffield. I had a PowerPoint party the next week that I needed to prepare a five minute presentation for. During my visit, I was helping my friend to calculate the car carbon footprint of the caramel which he makes. Doing this research led me to discover a great website called Our World in Data that has some amazing graphs about the number of cows and sheep in the world. I'm a big fan of graphs, so I decided to make the impact of cows and sheep the topic of my five minute presentation. It needed a funny title, so I called the talk Cows, Sheep, Should You Be Afraid? It was a lot of fun to put together, but the research required me to read about climate change, and what I read made me curious to know more. By total coincidence, my Facebook feed about around the same time had coverage of a new climate protest group, Extinction Rebellion, who were blocking roads in London. The fact that people were taking this kind of direct action was also really interesting to me, so in the new year, I went along to one of the first XR meetups in Edinburgh, where they explained how their group worked. They are organized into subgroups who focus on different things. They had a research group, so of course that's the one that I joined. By the start of February, I had created a Google Doc where I could keep notes on the academic papers and news articles which I started to read. In mid-February, I had another PowerPoint party to prepare for, so I wrote a presentation about the political response to climate change, which I tried to make less scary by including pictures of cute dogs. Attempting to explain climate change in five minutes went about as well as you'd expect, so I doubled down on the research, bought my first couple of books on the topic, and decided that I would write a 60-minute talk. I have spent over 80 hours in the last couple of months researching this topic. I believe that this is the most important issue facing all of humanity right now, and so I want to share with you what I've learned. This is going to be a talk in seven parts. Climate change can feel like a distant problem. However, I want to tell you about the impacts which are already being felt today and what we can expect in future. I will give some details about the political response so far, along with a vision for what it means to decarbonize the world. I'll end with some reasons to be hopeful and details of how you can make a difference. We'll start with some climate science basics. This is the world's oldest continuous CO2 monitoring station, which was started in 1958. CO2 in the atmosphere acts as an insulator, so the more CO2 we have, the warmer the planet gets. Homo sapiens showed up about 400,000 years ago. We started farming and building settlements about 20,000 years ago. In the last 800,000 years, the level of CO2 has never climbed above 300 parts per million. The last time CO2 levels were in the range 300 to 400 parts per million was 3 million years ago. Temperatures at that time were 2 or 3 degrees Celsius warmer, and sea levels were at least 15 meters higher. Since 1950, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere has climbed incredibly rapidly, rising to over 400 parts per million. Looking at the trend in recent years, CO2 levels have already reached 410 parts per million and are growing at 2 or 3 parts per million per year. So by 2030, we might already reach a CO2 level of 440 parts per million. This has already had a directly observable impact on global temperatures. The world is already an average of 1 degree Celsius warmer today. The 20 warmest years on record happened in the last 22 years. Water expands when it heats up, so the sea level is rising with the increase in temperature. We can also see that ice around the world is melting. Arctic ice melting doesn't raise the sea level because it floats on water already. However, Greenland and Antarctic ice sit on top of land, so as it melts, it runs into the oceans and will push up sea levels by meters. CO2 emissions are unlike most other environmental problems, where recovery can happen quite quickly. The CO2 emitted in the last 100 years is still warming the planet today. If we completely stopped emissions today, the world would continue warming for some time. 
unless humanity invents a way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at massive scale, the CO2 previously emitted will maintain the higher temperatures for thousands of years. This leads to the concept of a carbon budget. That's the total amount of CO2 which we can emit without causing more than, than a target amount of warming. Our remaining carbon budget is so small that the actions we take in the next 10 years will determine the world which humanity will live in for thousands of years. This animation is the best visualization I have seen of what we've discussed so far. There are six charts. The carbon budget is our cumulative CO2 emissions. There are markers for the thresholds above which we are committed to 1.5 degrees Celsius warming and 2 degrees Celsius of warming. Below that is the annual CO2 emissions over time. The middle spiral is showing the CO2 concentration observed in the atmosphere over time. And the right hand spiral is showing global mean temperatures observed over time. Climate change can feel distant, however, its impacts are already being felt today. A warmer planet drives more evaporation, which puts more water in the air. That means that when it rains, it rains even more heavily. This is already having measurable impacts, with some areas of the US getting 70% more rain on days with extremely heavy rainfall. This also means that when it's cold enough to snow, you'll get heavier snowfall. So climate change makes snow rarer, but heavier when it does happen. A warmer planet with warmer oceans and more water in the air means stronger hurricanes and heavier rainfall. Higher sea levels mean that when storms make landfall, there is even higher storm surge. This photo is from 2017 and shows two hurricanes and a tropical storm. Irma, the centre hurricane in this image, broke a new record for hurricane intensity by sustaining 185 mile per hour winds for 36 hours. In the days after this photo was taken, the storm on the right strengthened into a hurricane while the middle hurricane was still going, marking the first time on record where two Atlantic storms had 150 mile per hour winds at the same time. In 2012, Superstorm Sandy made landfall in New Jersey, bringing with it a nine foot storm surge. That's a three meter surge in sea level. Events like this are going to become more common. Sea level rise since 1950 has already doubled the chance of a sandy level storm surge. By 2100, sandy level storm surges are likely to occur roughly annually along the east coast of the US. This will wipe out coastal cities like Atlantic City. Heat waves are now much more common. Extreme temperatures, which used to affect about 0.1% of land each summer, now affect about 10% of land each summer. This slide lists a couple of heat waves which were particularly deadly, but heat waves in general are now much more common. The same increased evaporation, which leads to heavier rain, dries out the ground leading to extended droughts. California has recently seen the worst drought since records began. Hotter winters mean reduced snowpack to provide water through the year. The impact in the Rocky Mountains threatens the water supply for 70 million people. 5.7% of global land area has already been transformed by these changes in climate. Drought causes crop failures. In 2017, the number of people globally going without enough food rose for the third year in a row. This began to reverse the previous long-term decline in global hunger. We are seeing more longer lasting and larger wildfires. This is due to a warming climate, declining snowpack and changing forestry practices. Climate change is a threat to global security. Syria was in drought for the five years up to 2011, pushing two or three million people into extreme poverty. 
This was a contributor to the breakout of the Syrian civil war that has been in our news ever since. The then chair of the US National Intelligence Council and the UK government chief scientist are both on record that we are likely to see further climate change related conflict breaking out by 2030. The UN are a conservative organization, so it is so it is particularly worrying that their 2019 Global Environmental Outlook report states that a major species extinction event compromising planetary integrity and Earth's capacity to meet human needs is unfolding. Planet Earth has experienced five major mass extinction events. We are now living through the sixth mass extinction event. In the last 50 years, the average population of vertebrates has declined by 60%. 40% of all insect species are at risk of extinction in the next few decades. This is being caused by more than climate change. However, a rapidly, a rapidly changing climate will wipe out many species which are already vulnerable. We have already radically transformed the makeup of life on Earth. 96% of the biomass of mammals on Earth are humans and the animals that we eat. Only 4% are wild mammals. 70% of the biomass of birds are the birds that we eat. Only 30% are wild birds. The impact today is already scary. Unfortunately, the next couple of sections don't get much better. Please bear with me as I promise that there is some hope later in this talk. The way that climate change forecasts usually work is to look at various temperature change scenarios by the end of the century. These can be summarized as follows. One degree Celsius is what we have today. There are already impacts and we have no way of undoing these. We want to end up with a maximum of one and a half degrees Celsius temperature rise, although time is running out for this to remain achievable. The difference in impact between 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius is surprisingly big, and we'll look more at that in just a moment. Scenarios with temperature increases above 4 degrees Celsius are really scary. To achieve 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to cut CO2 emissions by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. Everything we've previously spoken about gets worse as the temperature increases. This slide attempts to quantify some of these differences for 1.5 versus 2 degrees Celsius. 2 degrees Celsius will ter terraform an extra 9% of the Earth's land. Hundreds of millions of extra people will suffer from extreme heat waves and difficulty accessing water. Every single coral reef will die and the Arctic will commonly have no ice during summer. It's difficult to be specific about the impacts of temperature increases above 4 degrees Celsius. The projected changes to the planet are so radical that large areas of the world would become uninhabitable. Extreme heat waves with apparent temperatures peaking at over 55 degrees Celsius would regularly affect many densely populated parts of the world. There would be hundreds of millions of refugees from these areas. This level of mass migration would drive conflict, made worse by warming-induced crop shortages. This is an apocalyptic vision. And this is a transformation which could happen as soon as the 2060s if we don't reduce emissions and get unlucky about tipping points. This worst case scenario could arrive by the time I'm in my 70s and when kids being born today are in their 40s. A feedback loop is a process which responds to a warming planet by causing more warming. A tipping point is a point past which a process will continue and can't be stopped. Melting ice reveals the much, the much darker ocean or land underneath. This absorbs more heat, which warms the planet further. A warming planet results in more forest fires. These directly release CO2 and also reduce the amount of trees available to absorb CO2. 
The melting of large areas of permafrost will unlock vast quantities of frozen carbon, driving up CO2 by as much as 100 parts per million. And our best guess is this process begins at scale around 2 degrees Celsius of warming. We are only just discovering that Antarctica and Greenland may already be past a tipping point at current temperatures. They might have already started to collapse. If these ice sheets were to melt completely, it would drive meters of sea level rise. These feedback loops and several others are not included in most projections because there are still lots of uncertainty about exactly when they will kick in. This means that the possible worst case outcomes are even worse than you usually hear about. I have felt real despair about these projections. Writing these slides was really difficult. However, we have a responsibility to look past that despair and understand how much can still be done to make things better. Climate change has been a topic of scientific debate going back to the 1800s. It took until the 1980s for consensus to emerge that climate change was happening and was caused by human activity. Identifying human actions as the cause of climate change was made much easier by the rapidly growing world population, which made the human impact on the world much more profound and directly measurable. We'll now look at the political response so far to climate change. In the late 80s and into the 90s, the key transnational organizations were established. The IPCC pulls together relevant scientific research into regular assessment reports. AR5 came out in 2014 and AR6 will come out in 2022. The UNFCCC meets annually to discuss the global response to this research. They had their first annual Conference of the Parties meeting in 1995. In the late 90s and through the first decade of the 21st century, the world tried to agree a scheme of top-down targets. The result was the Kyoto Protocol. This vision ultimately failed because major developed countries like the US, Canada, Japan and Russia refused to be bound by a treaty which didn't set targets for developing countries. In 2015, a new approach was agreed, the Paris Agreement, which aims to limit the average global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit this increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Under this agreement, there are no top-down targets and no penalties. Instead, each country must define its own nationally determined contributions. The first NDCs are due in 2020 and every five years afterwards. All NDCs are reviewed together in 2023 and every five years afterwards to, to identify what more needs to be done. This allows for ever more ambitious targets to be set. In 2018, the IPCC released a special report on the impact of 1.5 degrees Celsius versus 2 degrees Celsius. This set some key targets. To limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, CO2 emissions must decline 45% by 2030 and must hit net zero by 2050. This graph shows the global emissions per year in various scenarios, and the labels on the right show the resulting temperature rise at the end of the century. The current NDCs are not enough. If we achieve current pledges and targets, we will likely end up with 3 degrees Celsius of temperature rise, which puts us at serious risk of hitting tipping points, which cause warming beyond these forecasts. We need even more action if we really want to keep warming below 2 degrees Celsius. These graphs show various scenarios for CO2 emissions that limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius, the left graph, or 1.5 degrees Celsius, the right graph. Blue lines are scenarios which would have been possible if we had started reducing emissions sooner. Red lines are scenarios if we delay action even longer. If the world had taken serious action back in 2000, the rate would have been 4% a year to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we start taking serious action this year, the required rate is 18% a year to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius.
This is barely plausible. Limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius only requires 5% a year reductions in emissions starting in 2019. Some countries exclude international aviation and shipping emissions from their targets. Some countries allow for part of their targets to be, to be met through emissions tradings. Understanding these distinctions is really important to make sense of the targets which different countries are setting. The UK set out climate change targets in law in 2008. The initial target was an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, not including international aviation and shipping, and only allowing emissions trading within the EU scheme. Scotland set out climate change targets in law in 2009. The initial target was also an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, with a 2010 amendment to include international aviation and shipping. The Scottish target is currently under review and is going to be increased to a 90% 2050 target with, a, with an amendment to prohibit meeting the target through carbon credits. However, territorial, territorial emissions are those which happen in a country. Consumption emissions add in the emissions embedded in, embedded in imports. This makes a big difference. On a territorial basis, UK emissions are down 41%. On a consumption basis, they're only down 3%. Climate change is a polarized subject. There are people who deny that climate change is real, and then there are protesters holding banners saying that we have 12 years to save Earth. There is no doubt that climate change is happening. However, the movement to tackle climate change has repeatedly drawn lines in the sand to try and motivate action. The 2018 IPCC report included figures that predict that, without action, within 12 years it will be too late to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Obviously, if we fail, the world will not end in 12 years. We will simply have committed ourselves to a darker future. The exact timeline for when we predict we will cross particular thresholds has changed before and will change again. Climate change is a sliding scale of badness and we can always fight to make it better than, than it otherwise would have been. In the next section, I want to tell you a bit about what it means to build a zero carbon world. There are actually three gases which we need to worry about. Carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide are all global warming gases. This graph is scaled to show each gas in units of CO2 equivalent emissions. That means the impact they have in terms of the equivalent volume of CO2 being emitted. We need all of these lines to drop to zero, but it's clearly CO2 which is the biggest problem. This graph shows the contribution to global CO2 equivalent emissions from different sectors. We need all of these sectors to drop to zero. However, it's clear that energy is the biggest single sector which needs to be addressed. But not the only one. Once we've addressed energy, we will have to move on to others like transport and forestry, and residential and commercial. All of these things will have to be tackled in the coming decades. In 2018, the world used 3 terawatts of electricity. This was only a small fraction of total energy usage, which was 18 terawatts. It's really important to understand that electricity is currently only powering a fraction of our energy needs. All the rest of the energy is used for other uses like heating, transport and industrial processes. This means that if we decide to electrify everything, then we need an electric grid with six times more capacity than it has today. Solar power is likely to be a major future energy source. As of 2019, solar powers about 2.5% of global electricity. The graph on the left shows that cumulative capacity has increased rapidly as the average price of solar has declined. Solar has been growing at 30% a year for the last several years. This is much faster than any other source. If 30% a year growth could be sustained, then solar could provide all of 2018's world energy needs by 2040. Not just electricity, but all 18 terawatts. <laughs>
If we imagine that only 20% a year of growth can be sustained, then it would take until 2050 for solar to provide 18 terawatts. Global scale renewables are going to need a lot of land. If we want 18,000 gigawatts of solar power, we will need a square of solar panels where each side is 950 kilometers long. That means covering every square kilometer of an area about four times the size of the UK. This is country scale renewables. However, for comparison, the world uses 40 million kilo square kilometers of land for livestock. So if we had 3% less livestock, we'd have plenty of space for renewable energy. This is what the future looks like. We need more of this, much more. This is a 110 megawatt solar thermal installation in Nevada. We need 10 of these to get just one of the 18,000 gigawatts of energy, which we need. We need to do much more than make our electricity renewable. We need to reinvent everything which uses fossil fuels to either use electricity or come, come up with some other way to power them renewably. That means we need to reinvent all fossil fuel burning transport, cars, ships, planes and trucks. We need to reinvent the way that we heat our homes. If, we have a, if, if you have a gas boiler at home like I do, that needs to be replaced within the next 30 years with something which doesn't burn fossil fuels. We need to insulate our homes so that less of the energy we spend on heating is wasted. We have 30 years to reinvent the world we live in. It's important to acknowledge the significance of what we are going to lose in this process. Fossil fuels are a very cheap and easy source of energy that has enabled the rapid global development we have seen in the past 200 years. Much of this wouldn't have been possible without fossil fuels. However, it's time to admit that fossil fuels are also a very dirty source of energy that has polluted the world we live in. We must rapidly decarbonize the world and transition to power everything with clean energy. We must halt all oil and gas exploration now. Most of the fossil fuel reserves that we already know about need to stay in the ground. We are at the beginning of a vast global transformation and there are some good reasons to be hopeful. Emissions in China have leveled off. They haven't actually come down yet, but if they had continued to climb at their previous rate, we would have been in serious trouble. Emissions in the USA and EU28 are both declining, not as fast as they need to, but it's a start. India's emissions are still growing as it lifts its people out of poverty. We need to see this line and the all others line leveling off really soon and then declining rapidly towards zero. 2017 was the first ever year where more new solar capacity was installed globally than new fossil fuel capacity. Sales of electric cars have been growing 50 to 60% a year for the last six years. As an exciting example of the progress being made, all 16,000 buses in the Chinese city of Shenzhen are electric as of 2018. 12 major cities have pledged to only buy electric buses from 2025 onwards. Companies and cities around the world are stepping up to the challenge and making significant commitments. Maersk, the largest shipping company in the world, has committed to be carbon zero by 2050. They have made this commitment now because they need to start buying carbon zero ships by 2030 and those ships don't exist yet. The world has 10 years to bring to market a carbon zero ship. Unilever have committed to directly support more renewable electricity supply than they consume by 2030. 19 major global cities have committed to make all new buildings carbon zero by 2030 and upgrade all existing build buildings to be carbon zero by 2050. IKEA have committed to have all their last mile deliveries of furniture to customer homes be carbon zero by 2025. And Apple already use 100% renewable energy and they are working with suppliers to get them to use renewable energy and have started a joint venture to produce carbon zero aluminium. We already know many of the solutions which we can deploy to reduce carbon emissions. There is no silver bullet, 
Instead, there are lots of different solutions which all need to be deployed. This table is taken from the Drawdown project, which modeled the realistic impact of 80 different solutions over the period running up to 2050. So what does this mean for you? How should you respond to the climate crisis? We know what the impacts of climate change will be on the world. It's up to you to decide whether to accept those impacts or to avoid them. The easiest action that you can take is at the personal level. There are a few simple steps that you can take to reduce your carbon footprint. Eat less meat, especially beef and lamb. Per gram of protein, beef and lamb have a six times larger carbon footprint than any other source of protein. Fly less, especially long haul flights. Walk, use a bike or public transport locally. Sell your car if possible. Reduce the carbon footprint of your home. Install insulation and switch to LED lighting. And reduce the carbon footprint of your lifestyle. Avoid buying things that you don't really need. Divest from fossil fuels. This applies to your own private investments and your pension. Don't profit from the, from the fossil fuel industry. Free up capital to invest in decarbonizing the world. There are a wide range of relevant charities who would love your support. Talk to your friends and family about climate change. I find that this is a topic which lots of people avoid. It's a difficult topic, but we can't, we can't afford to ignore it. Your family and friends may work with other companies and organizations who all need to engage with this issue. As a reminder, to limit warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, we need a 45% decrease in CO2 emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Every single organization needs to be starting the transition now and setting bold targets. These targets must be set in terms of absolute numbers. Any target which is expressed in terms of the volume of business being done can result in higher, abs higher absolute emissions if growth is faster than emissions reductions. You can demand action at lots of levels, from your local council, from the company you work for, and from the building that you work in. The UK and Scottish targets are likely to be revised this year to be net zero by 2050. This is great news, but lots of work remains to be done to deliver on these targets. As you can see from this graph of UK emissions, uh, of these, of this of UK emissions changes by sector, most of the improvements so far have come from cleaner power. The UK as a whole claims to have reduced emissions by 41% since 1990. However, these are just the territorial emissions. Our consumption emissions have only reduced by 3%. The UK needs to do more to meet our existing targets, and we need to do even more to figure out how to avoid outsourcing our emissions through increasing trade. If you are interested in pushing for more action, reach out to your local Green Party. They've been fighting this battle for a long time and will have lots of great information about how best to engage. Many people around the world have concluded that the only real option left is to protest. School children are skipping school to protest because they don't want to grow up in a broken world. Extinction Rebellion protested continuously in London for over a week and had more than 1,000 members arrested during this time. That makes it the largest civil disobedience event in recent British history, larger than nuclear protests and poll tax riots. 1,000 arrests is comparable to the number of arrests from the suffragette movement. I stand here in front of you today to convince you of the urgency of tackling climate change. The science is clear. If we continue to emit greenhouse gases, climate change will become more extreme with increasingly severe and irreversible consequences. We have very little carbon budget left. Fossil fuels are an easy source of energy, and it will be tempting to continue to use them to power the world and lift people out of poverty. The fossil fuel industry's huge profits depend directly on persuading humanity to use these fuels for longer than we should. We must choose a different path. We must build a better future, a more sustainable future.
There is a lot of exciting and important work which needs to be done. We have 30 years to reinvent the world that we live in. There are good reasons to be optimistic. The world has come together to tackle global issues before. We must come together again to solve climate change. In 2015, the countries of the world made a commitment to, li to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius. Every government, every city, every company, every building needs a plan to get to net zero by 2050. They must all be held to account. Climate change is not an environmental cause. It is a moral cause. It falls in the footsteps of every other such cause. The abolition movement, the women's suffragette movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement. All of these movements have faced prolonged resistance, but in the end they all succeeded. Addressing climate change won't be easy. There will be setbacks. More should have been done sooner. But we must now accept the responsibility to preserve and restore our only home for ourselves and for our children. These are the four climate change books which I have read in the last couple of months. The, four, the first answers all the basic questions about climate change. The second one talks about why humanity has done such a bad job of dealing with climate change. There is no planet B talks about climate change and other issues facing the planet along with how we can each make a difference. Drawdown examines 100 of the most important policy interventions which can address climate change. I found the large number of concrete ways to make a big difference really uplifting. Thank you very much.